Hello, I'm Jerry Sabog, founding director of the VMR Institute for Vitreous Macula Retina in Huntington Beach, California, and professor of clinical ophthalmology at the Doheny Eye Institute in Los Angeles. The topic that I presented today at the ASRS is vitrectomy for floaters. We've done a considerable amount of research to better understand <clears throat> how floaters impact vision. And we've developed a method to cure the floaters that is proven now to be effective as well as safe. The floaters are the result of aggregation of collagen and vitreous into objects that cast shadows on the retina. And <clears throat> nearsightedness is a common cause, but aging and uh, posterior vitreous detachment is the most common cause of bothersome floaters, accounting for uh, two-thirds of patients who are bothered by floaters. In an attempt to better understand why patients are unhappy with floaters, we uh, developed a method to measure contrast sensitivity. And we discovered that contrast sensitivity is severely impacted by floaters. The uh, reduction in contrast sensitivity experienced by floater patients compared to age match controls is on the order of 77%, and that's highly statistically significant. That was always a very difficult decision to make, <clears throat> mostly because we didn't have objective, reproducible, quantitative indices of, dis of disease severity. But now that we have uh, the contrast sensitivity data that we've generated, uh, we feel confident that it is a very useful index with which to select patients for vitrectomy for floaters. We're currently working on a structural correlate of this functional deficit using ultrasonography to develop an index of the echodensity of the vitreous, which we feel will be a second useful metric with which to select patients for vitrectomy. Our initial results have demonstrated that there is a very strong correlation between the degree of vitreous echodensity as measured by ultrasonography and the diminution in contrast sensitivity. We very carefully looked at uh, the vitrectomy procedure, fully aware of the various risks such as uh, infection and endophthalmitis, uh, hemorrhage, retinal tears and detachments, problems with intraocular pressure, problems with macular edema, and uh, problems with cataracts. And we developed an approach that we theorized would be uh, safe as well as effective. And that approach is what we have implemented and what I reported on today in a series of 98 cases. Our approach is based on the use of 25 gauge instruments, which we feel is safer from the perspective of retinal breaks and detachments. We <clears throat> employ highly beveled incisions, which mitigates against endophthalmitis, and use non hollow probes for cannula removal at the end of the case. Most importantly, I do not induce a posterior vitreous detachment surgically to further decrease the risks of retinal breaks, but also to maintain intravitreal oxygen levels low enough so that we theorize it would mitigate against the formation of postoperative cataracts. What we found compared to previous studies is that we have no cases of infection, no cases of intraocular pressure problems, no cases of macular edema. We had one case of vitreous hemorrhage, which cleared spontaneously after two weeks, 
And <clears throat> one case of a central retinal artery occlusion, which we don't believe was in any way related to surgery, but it did occur on the first post-operative day. We've had no cases of retinal tears and detachments in contrast to other series that have reported up to 30% iatrogenic retinal breaks when a surgical PVD is induced. Our incidence of cataracts that need surgery was only 23% in contrast to patients with macular pucker where 53% required uh, uh, cataract surgery. Patients with um, retinal detachments was 67 percent and macular holes even higher. A direct comparison to other series where vitrectomy was performed for floaters demonstrates that our incidence of 23 percent is uh, far lower than the 60 percent that was experienced in Sweden and the 50 percent that was experienced in Amsterdam. So we feel that our approach compares very favorably in terms of safety, but we also have very interesting efficacy data to demonstrate how helpful this procedure is. Limitations of the study are uh, really um, not that many. I, I think that these results are applicable to a uh, wide variety of patients and in particular considering the diminution in contrast sensitivity that we have detected in patients who are afflicted with bothersome floaters we were very pleased to see that within one week of surgery every single patient had normalization of contrast sensitivity and this normalization was sustained at one month three months six months and greater than 12 months following vitrectomy surgery. So I feel that with those types of results, a number of things uh, arise. Firstly, the dilemma as to who is seriously afflicted with clinically bothersome floaters can be addressed with the use of contrast sensitivity testing to identify which patients are the best candidates. Secondly, we now have an objective, reproducible, quantitative method with which to gauge the response to therapy. And in this instance, it's been overwhelmingly successful in every single case. Well, that's a good question. I, I think that the big problem with uh, patients who are afflicted with floaters and their frustration with the medical profession is that we have, until now, not had useful clinical indices with which to determine who really is significantly bothered by the floaters and who isn't. Simply talking to the patient is useful but hasn't to date made clinicians comfortable enough to be able to select patients who are appropriate candidates for surgery. I feel that measuring contrast sensitivity provides one useful clinical index. I also feel that the advent of quantitative ultrasonography is going to provide another useful index because then we'll have functional deficit as well as a structural evaluation of this phenomenon. And with those two indices, we'll be able to select patients. And I predict that as more clinicians do that, they'll be comfortable, <clears throat> firstly, with identifying and recognizing this as a disease entity but secondly, they'll feel comfortable with instituting limited vitrectomy as an effective and safe way to cure floaters. Well, as I mentioned earlier, the future directions are to further develop quantitative ultrasonography that will enable us to have another clinical index. We're also working on optically based methodologies that will characterize the floaters on a molecular level. Firstly, so that we can understand their origin, but secondly, so that we can have a different method with which to assess just how severe these floaters are. I predict <clears throat> that not only will these uh, objective methods to assess patients be useful today, but I believe that it'll be useful to evaluate the efficacy of future therapies. 
I predict that somewhere in the future, down the road, the surgical approach will be replaced by a pharmacologic approach. I believe that there are going to be drugs that we can inject to dissolve these floaters, and it'll be very important for us to have objective clinical measures of the degree of abnormality before intervention and the response to therapy after intervention. A lot of people promote the use of YAG lasers to treat floaters. It's never been shown with any objective methods that the treatments are effective. And I think that the approach using YAG lasers should be subjective to the scientific scrutiny utilizing these tests and other tests to be developed, as well as pharmacologic vitriolysis, which I believe will be the future form of therapy for this condition. Well, I, I think that it's important that we realize that um, in spite of the medical profession not recognizing this as a disease entity, the patients are serious about their affliction. And we owe it to the patients to take them more seriously. And I think that the development of these <clears throat> objective quantitative measures of vision as well as structural changes with ultrasonography and optically based in, uh, approaches in the vitreous are going to enable clinicians to get more comfortable with this as a disease entity. And the reason is that for us to really fulfill the mission of modern medicine, we need to take the patient seriously, we need to define these diseases in scientific terms, and we need to help these patients if we're going to achieve the mission of modern medicine which is to help people die young, as late in life as possible. The technique that we employ for vitrectomy differs from other conditions in that we do not remove all the vitreous. We simply remove the vitreous that is responsible for the patient's symptoms. And in particular, we do not induce a surgical PVD, which is commonplace throughout the world. We feel it's not necessary in these individuals. Our experience has shown that there are no untoward consequences of not inducing a surgical PVD. And we feel that it mitigates against iatrogenic retinal breaks. But also, by not inducing a PVD, the postoperative retrolental oxygen levels are lower. And that, therefore, decreases, at least theoretically, the development of cataracts in need of cataract surgery. And our experience has borne that out we have half or less than half of the incidence of cataracts uh, requiring surgery postoperatively in comparison to other surgical approaches for vitrectomy. To some extent, that's because we also leave three to four millimeters behind the lens, and it's known that vitreous contains antioxidants. So I think the combined effects of how we've approached this problem are what uh, explains our results um, and are different from the uh, usual approach to vitrectomy. I think it's important to realize that none of the patients in the series of 98 cases are individuals who came in and were immediately scheduled for surgery. We always tell patients to try to cope for various periods of time before undertaking the serious discussion of uh, surgery. Indeed, the average coping time of the uh, series of patients that I presented was 33 months. And many of these patients had tried YAG laser treatments, had tried to cope, and were still very unhappy. So I counsel all patients to try to cope before considering surgery.